you don't have any cash. The consumer says, where's my money? No one answers that question. That's the thing. So anybody in that chain? I mean, that's it. So a lot of us in the room here are entrepreneurs. Say you're at a place where you're in and you just closed your Series A, you've got some capital now, you've got some powerful friends, and you're trying to figure out how to find a solution. Where do you start? Well, you know, that's an important, that's an important question. I think of, I would say that, again, feel free to chime in, but I would say that the time for compliance is not when you raise the money after you've been operating. I know that seems like the right time. The time for compliance is before you do the activity in that state. It's very difficult. Regulators are a special type of people. I mean, it's an interesting process. It's definitely an art of dealing with regulators. And you do not want to say, yeah, we wanted to comply, now let me have money. That's not going to work. So it's really, the time for asking that question is before you do the activity. Because if you say, you know, I want to get licensed, you know, these are my activities. Yes, I've done them in the past. No, I don't want to get that license anymore. You know what I mean? You know, I didn't comply with it. It's just a very tough sell. And you start, you know, at a disadvantage. So I think the time for asking the question is the most important part. Because you can get, states are, regulators are willing to say, usually the answer is yes. But they're willing to answer the question whether they think that you're subject to the money transmission regimes. In my experience, they're fairly willing to say, yeah, we would consider you a money transmitter. So I'll answer your question. So I agree with what Ryan said. The states are the problem, right? I mean, getting the, well, it's okay, so we'll get the debate going here. I mean, the federal regime, I think, is manageable. I mean, you can register. What do you do? You register. You have an effective anti-money laundering policy and program. You verify your customer identity. You keep records. And you file suspicious activity reports over certain transaction thresholds. So you have to know your customer in a way that you might wonder if it's possible in a Bitcoin environment, given this philosophy of Bitcoin, right? So there's a legitimate question there about whether you can know who your customer is. But I think conceptually, it's manageable. It's hard. And I don't want to underestimate it at all. I mean, as Claire said, it is, it's a difficult process. You can't just take the form off the shelf. You've got to really strip everything down, the funds, flows, and where does the data flow, and who the parties in the system, and how are the accounts titled, and where are they sitting. And it's an elaborate process to figure that out. And most startup life now just haven't had the time or bandwidth to put all that together. So they're kind of coming to us saying, help. You know, we want to do it, but how do we do it? And there's just a, you know, there's some homework that has to be done to figure it out. But I think it's manageable in terms of costs and expense. You just have to have some processes. The state piece, however, is a real difficult problem because it takes, you know, nine to 12 months to get a license. You're in an unusual space. This isn't your Western Union and MoneyGram type money transmission. It's a lot more involved. It involves more parties in the process. Regulators ask questions, as they should. And so there's timing. And it's really a million-dollar proposition. By the time you're going to get your licenses, the licensing fees, obtain the bonds, the surety bonds, pay your lawyer to help you put together all those funds flows and fill out those applications and deal with the interviews, it's at least a million dollars. And probably more, you might not even be licensed in a lot of places. So if you don't have the licenses, then what that really means is you're engaged in unlawful conduct if you fall within the crosshair, right? So the first question is really, am I doing something that triggers state money transfer laws? And I guess I'm here to say that there are some models, some pieces of this ecosystem that I don't think do require state money transfer licenses, or at least not in all states. But that's a very fact-intensive question, something that needs to be proven out. States don't have a lot of interpretive rulings on this yet. So it's worthwhile asking the question. But if you then ask the question and you reach the conclusion that I am regulated, 
then um, you don't have a grace period. You, you either can't do the activity, you gotta get a license, um, and, you know, or partner with somebody who has a license. I think it's, it's worth, worthwhile here to note, though, that banks, um, at least national banks, are, uh, and some type of banks are not um, subject to state money transfer laws. So I mean, you can talk about partnering with either someone who has licenses in, in all the relevant states, or who um, is exempt from these laws in terms of a bank, but is, who is willing to do the services, not just provide you a merchant account, but who is willing to actually provide the services. And, uh, and, and it's, it's an uphill battle to get a financial institution to do that for you, right? All right, a quick question. Uh, yeah, actually, it's a <coughs> Um, a couple of questions. Uh, the first part is really um, touching what seems like a chicken before the egg problem. Right? Um, I'm sorry, what, the, what you're describing as um, now I have money, can I get regulated? You know, can I be compliant? It, it seems like a chicken before the egg or a horse before the cat car problem in the sense that, you know, I, um, it might take my business model to be successful so that I can have the money to spend a million dollars to get compliant. Um, it, it, do you, the first question is, do you um, know of uh, uh, either a model or a workaround that allows the, almost like a provisional license, the same way patent, patent law works. You get a provisional patent for a year, test it out, make sure it works, then you can spend $100,000, whatever it costs to get a, a real patent, right? That, that's the, 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 the first part of the question. The second part uh, is really directed towards Claire. In your experience, um, how much time did it take for you guys to get, you know, uh, I guess compliant nationwide, and perhaps more uh, equally as important, perhaps more importantly, how much money did it really cost you guys? Okay, so, I mean, I, the provisional answer, I think, what you all say is no. Uh, you could be a bank. Uh, I mean, so that's a, the very entry is a hard issue to absorb for uh, for my transfers. But the alternative is right. I mean, you're non-bank financial service provider. The alternative is to be a bank or, or other you know, financial institution. And that's really expensive, and they definitely have to get uh, licensed and chartered before they conduct business. Yeah, just a quick response to that. Um, prior to this act, in another company I worked for, we got money transmitter licenses in all states. It took us about 18 months, and we had a team of people that worked on it pretty much all the time. And um, so it, it is a lengthy process. And as I said in my prior remarks, you know, I just had to be available whenever any regulator wanted to ask, wanted me to answer questions, and a couple of them didn't want to give us licenses until they actually saw me. I don't know why at the time this <laughs> presence was required. So I tried, yeah, again, but again, they, that was part of their requirement, so I actually went to visit them in their respective state. And, you know, so you go along with whatever the process is, but, and while the information looks a lot the same from state to state, it has different nuances, and each state can do can tweak it whatever way they want, um, and there is no guarantee, but you don't want to get denied, because if you get denied by one, you have to go back and report to everybody else that you got denied by somebody, and that's another place to be. So it been 18 months, I'm gonna tell you, we went from sort of starting to finishing in 47 states in just a little over 18 months. Actually cost. Um, you know, <laughs> thankfully, I didn't have to keep that, but, you know, if by the time by the time you talk about, I mean, we had in-house counsel, so we probably had one and a half in-house counsel, a paralegal, me, uh, and I didn't do it full time, um, but and, you know, and then various outside counsel and um, administrative support. We had, I mean, I'm talking a team of you know five or six people who some of them worked on it first and full time, some of us worked on it as needed. Um, but oh, over and above that, I had a team of people, because I managed the risk management function, who actually had to be doing the monitoring and the identity <coughs> verification and all those other things. So it wasn't just the licensing, it was doing all the stuff that we were supposed to be doing to make sure that we were actually doing what our policy said we were going to do.